lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. This lecture today is about karma, which is a topic that's very popular today. Everybody seems to talk about it in some way or another. Uh, but it's very difficult to really pin down what someone might think or not think about karma. I mean, certainly there are many people who just reject it, that it's not something that's real. But in popular culture today, there seems to be a notion that there's something that's sort of holding the world together, that what comes around goes around, that there's some type of uh, order to all of this, you know, this life that we live. So what I want to do today is actually explain karma from you know, a general standpoint, but also we're going to look into some of the original Buddhist scriptures in the Pali language that actually talk about what karma is from the Buddhist perspective. Karma itself is a Sanskrit word. and Pali, it's a very similar word, word called uh, kama instead of karma. It's the same uh, concept, though. Karma means action. It means to act. That's where the root of that word comes from. So karma literally comes from deed, which is derived from kri, to do, to make, cause, effect. And we can wrap that all in this idea that there is a causal principle, that there is cause and effect. And things happen because there is some cause to them. So it, from that perspective, it's very simple. But when you look at it in terms of spirituality, it means something more than just... Uh, something physical, like cause and effect, like if I drop a ball, it, it falls to the ground and makes a noise. That's cause and effect. When we talk about spirituality or a spiritual work, then we need to think about how cause and effect goes beyond just this physical world, beyond just this three-dimensional world that we have a common experience of. And that's where it really becomes important, because when we just look at the world in a very superficial or just naive sense, without a lot of reflection or without a lot of study or meditation, we can't discover the reasons for all of our situation in life. There's just so much confusion. We don't really know a lot of things. We just have this experience, and then we have these issues, we have problems, we try to do things. Sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't work out. Sometimes we think we want something, some goal, but we end up getting it, and it's not really what we thought it would be, or it didn't provide the result of happiness that we might be looking for. So this concept of karma, while it is a Sanskrit word, and we relate it to the Eastern uh, traditions, the concept itself can be found in all real religions in different ways. So even in the Bible it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. From a, you know, maybe from a, a standard 
looking at that, it might be not a very controversial statement. A lot of people might really believe in that. But when something very unfortunate happens to us, something very tragic, we may question that. Or if something, you know, things that don't seem fair are happening to other people, it doesn't seem like this is hard to accept this. But when it happens to us, it seems like some something really wrong has happened in the cosmos, and I, um, I'm in a bad spot here. So it's difficult to really, when you really take this out and look at the way the world it, the way the world is, and all the very tragic, terrible things that are going on in the world, and then you connect that with karma, which says that everybody gets what they 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 receive their own causes that they put into the world, that they they end up getting what they receive. And you look around, you say, well, I see a whole bunch of very unfair things. If you really look just anywhere in society, you see people, they really deserve that situation. It seemed like that was, a, that seems like that was unfair. You know, I mean, we don't need to think too much about that. That's mostly what the news is filled up with. All sorts of tragedies. So how do we reconcile that with this idea that, you know, actions and matter, that it, it does matter. We should try to do good things because then we'll have good results. We should not do negative things because those have negative results. It's difficult because the more, the more you try to really be consistent with that, you'll see um, people who have really tragic things happen to them. They lose their faith or they lose any notion of a orderly cosmos. They say, this is just not fair. And they'll either scream obscenities at the world, that the world is terrible, or they'll, they'll curse God or something like that, and God is terrible because this tragedy happened to me, to my family. So that's when we're really tested. It's very easy to believe in this if you worked really hard and you had lots of good results and you really wanted to become a millionaire and you became a millionaire based on your own efforts and work. And then you're a celebrity and you talk about how great karma is. You worked really hard and it worked out for you. But what about all the other people that worked really hard and tragedy came in result? Which one? Like how does that how does that work? And just looking at our own life, we have to we have to think about that as well in the same way. In uh, Tarot and Kabbalah, a book by Samuel Unveyor, he says that Buddhists said there are three eternal things in life: the law, which is karma, nirvana, and space. It's a very deep uh, comment there because. What that actually means is that karma, cause and effect, is something very intrinsic to the whole universe. It couldn't, this universe, or this space that we could call the universe, only exists because it's, it's completely interwoven with causality, with karma. So just like you can't have one side of a coin, you always have two sides of a coin, right? So one side doesn't exist with the other. Well, in this, what we're saying here is that all three of these aspects are interdependent. So space, karma are two things that are interlinked. They don't exist outside of each other. They only exist in relationship to each other. And this third aspect is nirvana. So nirvana is a pure type of space, we can say. It's, we think of nirvana as... You know, it's a type of heaven or something very spiritual. It is. And we're not in nirvana. So the opposite of nirvana in Buddhism is samsara. But nirvana and samsara are the, intrinsically the same thing. When karma becomes purified, samsara is nirvana. And when there's actions which are impure, which cause you know, problems, then nirvana becomes samsara. So all three of these things are just different ways of looking at the same thing. They don't exist inter, in, uh, independent of each other. They exist interdependently. So karma is very important to at least begin to think about, begin to reflect how this, how, how is this uh, 
working in my life, in life, in the world. It's not something you can put off to the side too much. On the other hand, it's also something extremely difficult and almost impossible to completely understand. We can't put it inside of our intellect and try to rationalize every little thing that happens to everybody in the world. That's where a lot of people get tripped up, because they, they, they want to read about karma, and then they want to intellectually try to fit their ideas of, of how it could possibly be inside their head. But karma is something well beyond our, our intellectual capacities. Our intellectual capacities are just like this little ant. It's not very, it's very powerful in this society, but in terms of spiritual pursuit, it's actually a very low form of understanding. So in prior lectures, we talked about liberation. Because in, in, in these studies where we come from, we're not just interested in a so-called spiritual lifestyle or a spiritual way of being just as an end to itself. Meaning, we're doing whatever we're doing spiritually because we have some goal. We have some path, some level after level of consciousness that we want to attain. Not because we want to be selfish or egotistical about it, but because that's our real nature. That's where we came from. And we're returning to some state of consciousness uh, with wisdom. And the only reason we don't remember that already, because that's where we came from, is because we don't have that wisdom. We have ignorance right now. We have darkness. So we make that light inside of ourselves, which is that consciousness. So we, we're working on a path. We're looking to transform our state of mind, working to awaken our consciousness. So we talk about all types of spiritual practices, meditation, self-observation, transforming energy, in order to work on our condition. Because we have a certain condition in our life right now. And that condition, this, this, this thing that, that we have today, our life, is a representation of our karma. So we want to work with our karma in a way to eliminate it, to purify it, to get rid of it, as opposed to living a lifestyle that's adding to it. That being said... We're looking for that liberation, the liberation from karma, the liberation from samsara. And we talked about three types of ways, three ways that people try to find liberation. Maybe they consider themselves spiritual, or maybe they're, they're not. They're just they're maybe very sort of materialistic, or they don't have any thoughts about spirituality. But everybody's working for something, right? Another, a better job, more money, more freedom, more prestige, making your parents proud, working for something, trying to, you have a certain condition and you're working to liberate yourself from that condition. So the first thing is basic denial or ignorance, which is to say, of someone or we don't believe that we have anything to change about ourselves. That we already believe we are the, the way that we are is it. There's, we don't need to change. There's no need to make any changes. Who we are, the impulses that we have, the thoughts that pop into our mind, the emotions that we have, we should just take them 100% and say, that's who I truly am, and just express them. It sort of seems like a nice topic, a nice theory. Because if you have a thought, why shouldn't you express that thought? If you, if you feel hurt, or you feel... If you're angry towards someone, why should you not express your anger towards them? That's if that's who you really are. But you see, that's just it. If we don't accept that there's something else related to us, if there's something beyond these incessant types of thoughts, ruminations, negative thinking, if there's something else, then we should we should question: Are the types of thoughts I engage in really helping me get what I want in life? If I want to be happier, are these types of thoughts the place, the way that I'm going to achieve that? So even basic materialistic psychology would say that you can change. 
You can go to a therapist or any other way of working on yourself for self-change. So we know that thinking is a pattern of behavior of our mind, and it can change, absolutely. You need nothing to do with spirituality to do that. It's in our spiritual work, we do do that, but that in and of itself is just one little level. To at least accept that there's something worth changing. There's, there's so many people who, they're, they feel they are not the problem with, with life. Everybody else is. They have, you know, everyone else needs to change. They need to get out of my way. Um, uh, there's a lot of problems. People are making problems for me. And there may be someone in your life who's screaming in your face. And there may be someone in your life who's being really petty. And on a very superficial level, they're causing you some problems. But if you just look back just a couple more layers, you'll see that you have a relationship to that person. And you're feeding into their response. It's like the, the phrase, that they, they're pushing my buttons. And we blame them, but we, you know, we're the ones who have the buttons. We're the ones who have those sensitivities, those insecurities. And I mean, it is easy to just blame the other person. It's not, it's not about being morally good or bad. We all have our, our, our issues, right? So it's not saying that we need to feel bad about ourselves because we have them, but we need to accept and take responsibility Hey, maybe I can change those things about myself, and then I don't need to try to manipulate the outside world to prevent it from harming me. And, and, and I can instead change my condition in order to be okay with the way the world is. There's a great quote, I think it's by Shanti Deva. It says that it's better to put leather on your, on your feet, on your soles, than to try to carpet the whole world. And this is what we're if we're working in a very naive sense, without really any reflection, we, we tend to want to have the whole world change for us, right? So there's this type of basic denial of ignorance about why we have problems. And if we don't really have, um, if we don't really look inside, we end up blaming the outside world. So that's one way of saying basic denial or ignorance. The second uh, is hedonic pursuits. So hedonic means hedonism. But by this word, we're not just talking about like salacious types of sexual pursuits or anything like that. We're just talking about saying that the, the way to enjoy life is just to do things that make you feel excited and things that are very pleasurable and things that you really like to do. So it's like saying the point of life is just to work and then go on a really great retirement and just go on a big vacation, sit on the beach or something like that. Nothing wrong with taking a vacation or having a good, happy time. We need that. We absolutely need that. But that's not a way to liberate ourselves. That's just a temporary thing. But to, to constantly just, you know, be working every week, just focused on the next weekend so you can get a little bit of freedom from this condition you're in right now always working for the next vacation or the next, like, and then it's going to be great, but by the time you get there, it's over before you realize it, that type of situation, right? So it's not, it's not anything permanent. It's completely impermanent. So you can't say it's really a liberation. It's just a temporary situation. And it's good. We should be, going, we should be doing something healthy for ourselves. It's good to take a, a vacation. But it's another thing to say that's the point of life, Right? Now, the last one, false doctrines and rationalizations. This is the most tricky one. People get stuck in the other two all the time, but they're not usually too concerned with a spiritual pursuit, a spiritual lifestyle. They're just, they're not at that place or they don't, they're not interested. But when you get to someone who wants to find uh, something in spirituality, today you can find 10 million things on the internet and a vast majority of them are very superficial and just really don't add up to anything. There are a lot of theories that are talking about ways to make yourself feel good, um, or they're just very new ideas that really have no relationship with any of the ancient spiritual traditions, so we should be very cautious of that. And there's a lot of 
ways in, in, you know, common, you know, Orthodox religion today that says, um, if you want to make it to heaven, then you just need, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And whatever sect you might be related with will be different. Sometimes it will be, you need to receive these, sac- these sacraments and the way that we say that we, you need to receive them. Others say you need to believe or just, you know, give some faith that if you just believe, no matter what you do, you can just believe in something, and then that is the end. That's, that's your spiritual pursuit from doing whatever you want to then you can believe whatever in this new thing, and then everything will be okay. See, that actually breaks the law of karma, because how does that cancel out your debts? So there's something we could talk about that later as well. But... All sorts of things. So we're going to talk more about what did the Buddha actually say about karma. So I'm going to be quoting several um, scriptures from the Pali. Now, Pali is related to the most foundational and oldest traditionally accepted form of Buddhism. Um... So some people say it's closer to what maybe the Buddha was saying. Buddhism has a lot of different levels. So what 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 I mean by that is that some some forms of Buddhism focus um, more on a grounded lifestyle in the here and now, and there's other forms of Buddhism like Vajrayana Buddhism, which are talking about really cosmic principles of total awakening. And it's good to know both of those principles. But today we're going to be focusing on more, I think, something that we can relate to a little bit more about karma. So he talks about the false doctrines of inactivity. So this sort of falls in the third category that I was talking about, about false doctrines. So the beginning of this particular scripture, he says, Monks, there are these three sectarian guilds that when cross-examined, when pressed for reasons and rebuked by wise people, even though they may explain other way, otherwise, remain stuck in a doctrine of inactivity. So what he's, what he's talking about here is a doctrine of inactivity means a set of beliefs or actions that's not putting someone on the path to liberation. This means like inactivity, not canceling your karma. Because karma means that action. And he's talking about these three sectarian guilds. Now, they're old, old schools of philosophy. Some of them we have some some information about. Some of them have been sort of lost. We don't really know much. But they relate with things that are going on today as well. So I'm not really going to talk about the historical figures related to these guilds or these philosophical schools that existed in India. So the first thing he says, the first um, type of doctrine of inactivity is the following. There are Brahmins and contemplatives, contemplatives who hold this teaching, this view. Whatever a person experiences, pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor painful, all that all... That is all without cause and without condition. So this is sort of what we, do. we already basically talked about this. There are people who don't believe that karma exists at all, that everything exists without an ultimate cause. So where do we find that in today's world? We definitely find that in the status quo understanding of the cosmos, the academic, scientific status quo, which says that the universe just appeared in what they call the Big Bang or whatever. They have no reason, and they actually say there is no way we could ever even have a, a known reason as to why that occurred. Because everything that might have existed before that, was we, we have no knowledge of. But even if that Big Bang it happened exactly the way they think it happened, which no, no, no one was there, so... Certainly, the cosmos, the cosmos appeared in some way, in different ways. I'm not disputing that. We're not saying that, you know, we're not fundamentalists that say that the world was created in seven days. But 
what science is saying, and they're using, you know, telescopes and radio telescopes and calculations of physics and everything, and their data adds up to, you know, they're not trying to have some conspiracy, but they don't know. But their conception of the universe is 100% without meaning. There is no purpose, zero purpose. It just is happening. There's nothing that science could ever say about that. So there are some scientists, not all, and I, I happen to love science, I'm not trying to vilify it, but there are some very loud speaking scientists that try to pretend that there's some meaning that you can find inside of that. And they really rail against people who have uh, religion. Meanwhile, there's all sorts of people in the world today who have no sense of purpose in their life. They don't feel they have any purpose to be here. And we take that and we say that you shouldn't feel that way. You shouldn't feel that way. You're, something must be wrong with you because you should just be always happy that you're just alive. Even though there's no purpose to the universe and there's no reason why you're really here and you're just going to die and rot and after that you'll be completely gone forever. And after that the sun will explode and the earth will also be gone forever. But you shouldn't be sad about that. You should just continue being the way that you are. And if you continue to be that way, well, maybe you can go to therapy and maybe you can take an antidepressant and hopefully that'll fix everything, right? And, and I'm also not trying to vilify people who are, who are going to therapy or taking antidepressants, but there's a connection there, I believe. And if, you, if you really take what, what someone's saying about the, the universe and saying there's no purpose to any of this, it's all just randomness, and you're sitting there and you really soak that in, whether consciously or sort of just unconsciously just, you know, receiving that. Why would you, why wouldn't you be depressed about that? Why wouldn't you? Because there's no point to anything you do in the long run. And especially if your life has really got a lot of pain and suffering, it really becomes sort of, well, I think I'll just do whatever I feel like doing. I'll just try to have as much fun or just whatever. Kind of live a nonsensical life. Because nothing really matters. So that's what this is saying. We may not call them Brahmins and contemplatives today, but many philosophers and scientists today, right? This is the sort of a default perspective in the world today. Because we have the... Some people, they still find a lot of value in a very traditional form of religion and spirituality. But that comes with a whole other you know, constellation of ideas that are, seem very out of date for some people. So they don't, want, they, they don't feel at home in that world. And then they find themselves, by default, maybe in a worldview like this. Well, nothing really matters. The Buddha said, that's not true. And people, just like today, who say the world doesn't really have any cause or condition, they were saying that since the beginning of time. So it's nothing new. Well, what we should do is really reflect and think about how much of our ideas and uh, what our sense of self might have in relationship, in relationship to this. In other words, we may still hold this view in certain ways because we've been just sort of soaking in it for so long. So we need to, we need to maybe reflect on that. Now, to counter that is another quote in the Pali, which says, which says that, Beings are the owners of their kama, or karma, heir to their kama, born of their kama, related through their kama, and have their kama as their arbitrator. Kama is what creates distinctions among beings in terms of coarseness and refinement. So that's the Buddhist perspective. That's the exact opposite. Everything is karma. The second uh, false doctrine of inactivity is there are Brahmins and contemplatives who hold this teaching, hold this view. Whatever a person experiences, pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor painful, that is all caused by a supreme being's act of creation. So this one's a little, maybe a little bit more controversial in the Western world and what we might understand the world to be about. This is usually the common play between what someone says is uh, the difference between 
Buddhism and many other religions. Because most Western religions and many Eastern traditions as well talk about a creator God. And that creator God is responsible for all of creation because that creator God is completely omniscient, completely um, um, omnipotent, and does everything. So the question always comes up, why do, good, why do bad things happen to good people if God is benevolent? Why would a benevolent God allow these things to happen? And it's become so repetitive that you actually become numb to it because you can look at the tragedies. Look at the things that are happening, the earthquakes, hurricanes, all this stuff in society. Why is it happening? How could God allow this to happen? It's a very, very difficult question, so I'm not going to pretend that I can just say a couple words and, and convince anyone. But you have to begin to look at, there must be some other purpose to this whole situation. That this whole, this whole scenario of this earth, it's not, simply to, it's not simply here for us to have a great time, to just have a nice vacation for our whole life. That's not the purpose of our existence. The purpose of our existence is like what I said in the beginning of the lecture, to develop our inner wisdom, our consciousness, to know ourselves completely as a, as a, as a being, not as a human being, but as consciousness. And in order to do that, we have to go through a lot of experiences. This also becomes difficult to resolve if you believe that you have one life. Now, the popular phrase YOLO is actually completely against almost all forms of religion. Modern Christianity has, has thrown away the idea of multiple lives, but all the ancient forms of Christianity did not. You find it in Judaism, you find it in Kabbalah, you find it in Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, everything. Pythagorean, um, what is it called, metempsychosis, it's in Greek, it's in everything. So this idea that we just have one life to, to resolve all of our problems and all of our situation, and then also that all of this confusion and chaos and complicated mind that we have was produced just in the first you know, 15 to 20 years of our life, and we become this really complex person so fast. It's just a big problem to try to solve. You know, and again, if you look at it only that way, then you'd have to say everything that I am is related to my physical body and to the experiences I had when I was growing up. So that might re that might solve some problems. It solves a lot actually with our personality. You know, you have certain experiences as a child; they really form certain patterns of our personality. It causes problems, but that's not the full totality of our shape, where we came from. The reason that we're here today is not just because of this life, this childhood. That's a big thing to, to accept if that's something foreign. But we should at least have the perspective and knowledge that modern times is where that, that's a foreign concept. Modern Christianity, that's where that's a foreign concept. Most of the other religions throughout history are always talking about multiple lives. In fact, there's, there's a good reason to believe that the reason, the reason partly why Christianity focused so much on this life in a short period of time was because the pendulum had swung so far to the other side, which is to believe, I have like an infinite number of lives ahead of me, so why should I do any spiritual work? I'll just, just do what I do today. I got this problem right in front of me right now. I'm just going to solve all these issues. And next life, I'll, hopefully something better will happen. People are so stuck in that perspective that you need to be told, hey, you, you don't have an infinite number of lives. You still have a certain number. You still have a certain uh, opportunity. Don't waste it. You know, maybe next life you won't, it won't be better. Maybe it'll be worse. Maybe right now is your greatest opportunity. So there's this pendulum on both sides of there, right? So what he's saying here is that not every thing that happens is because God said that's got to happen that way. And once you, if you can accept that, then you, you have to really reconfigure your understanding. 
Why would God allow things to happen otherwise? And that's all has to do with free will. If we don't have free will, then what are we? We're just a, we're just a marionette of God or whatever you might want to say. So if God doesn't allow us to have free will, we cannot develop consciousness. So God has to allow us to make mistakes. Right? Perhaps. It's the same thing if you watch parents parenting their children. Some parents hover over their children too much and they don't allow their children to learn the skills of communication and the skills of negotiation and learning how to problem solve because the, the parent's always afraid. So they solve all the problems for the kid and the kid grows up and now they don't have any of the skills of communication, of negotiation, of learning how to solve problems. And that's not good for the child. So there's this very, you can get that kind of perspective that we're trying to figure out how to handle our own existence. And not just our physical existence, but we have these other levels of being that we just, we just have no knowledge of because we're not used to experiencing them. We learn how to meditate and we do certain practices, we can have those types of experiences. Certainly there's a tremendous amount that we could talk about there. And uh, at the end of the lecture, we can have some more dialogue, perhaps. But we're going to move on. Uh, as a quote in relationship to this last thing is that karma is also not fatalism. So Samuel Allenville writes, karma is the law of compensation, not of vengeance. There are some who confuse this cosmic law with detriment and even fatality or fatalism, believing that everything that happens to the human being in life is inexorably determined beforehand. It is true that the acts of the human being are determined by inheritance, education, and the environment. It is also true that the human being has free will and can modify his actions to educate his character, to form superior habits, to fight against weaknesses, to fortify virtues, etc. So, neither is our life completely ruled in every small way by God, by some supreme being, but also, our karma is not like a, a track that we just have no choice about. We have choices. We have karma that's going to, according to the law of karma, come to us one way or another. But we have the ability to make choices, to, to transform that situation, which is very important. Sometimes people say that certain situations had to happen that way. But it's usually not the case. It's like, I had to, this had to happen to me that was very bad because then something else happened to me that was good. Well, certainly that was the case. And maybe something bad happened and you reflected on yourself and then something good happened. You learned something good. But it's not necessarily that is the way, that is the only way your life could have unfolded. There's two sides to that. It could have been worse or it could have been better. <laughs> it could have been different. But we make the decisions that we make based on who we are, based on our reflections. But what it means is that it could always be worse. It also means it could always be better. So it's actually something a little bit liberating. You are, even though you might have a lot of mistakes in your past, it does not mean you're preordained to have misery in your future. You can pay it in certain ways. You can transform that situation. So if you do a wrong to someone or something, it doesn't mean that you will have that coming back to you in the same exact way, no matter what. There's a possibility that you can transform that situation, transform that karma. We're going to talk about that a little bit more as well. And related to that is the third thing that the Buddha states. There are Brahmins and contemplatives who hold this teaching, this view. Whatever a person experiences, pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor painful, that all that is all caused by what was done in the past. So this is an, another uh, sort of modification to what I was just saying. So, for example, sometimes we something happens to us, and we say, "Oh, that was just my karma. Nothing I could do about it." That might not be the case. You might have not had a karma from your past life 
or a past thing, a past moment that ensured that everything happened in that way. You might have just screwed up in that moment. So the reason why I bring that up is because when you say, oh, that was just my karma, then you're not really reflecting on what happened there. Maybe you just weren't paying attention. Maybe all the signs were there for you to avoid that painful circumstance, but you were too stubborn or you were too dull or, or whatever. And then, you know, something happened that's, un that's not pleasant. So if, it, if that's the case, it's not because something happened in the past that forced you to act that way, that forced you to make that mistake. So once again, the more you dive into all these things, although everybody talks about karma, no one is really studying it to see how we use it to make ourselves sometimes feel good when we shouldn't be and sometimes to make us feel bad when we shouldn't be or to just excuse our behavior. We have to study everything. We have to reflect on everything. So it's saying that we have karma. We also have free will. We also have these situations that were put without our will by somebody else's crazy will, somebody else's crazy actions, and we have to put up with it. That might not be our karma, right? Someone goes crazy on the streets and starts hurting people. Does it mean that every one of those people had karma and they needed to pay it? Or was it just that person who went crazy and just inflicted pain and suffering? Those people deserve that? Well, these types of teachings, you put them together, it says, no, there's something else. There's what we call the law of accidents. Because we have free will, I can go choose to do some really crazy, terrible things, and nothing is going to stop me. Unless, you know, not, God is, God's hand isn't going to come and squash me just because I'm doing it. And that's easy to prove because people are out there doing these crazy things. So, just because all this pain and suffering is happening in the world doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that the universe is just a random chaotic existence. It just means things aren't quite the way we might want to want them to be. They're not as simple. There's a bigger picture. And it does matter that we suffer. And we can, individually, collectively, do better. And we can transform our situation. If we, if we transform our state of mind, we impact every single person that we come across in our life. Could be hundreds, could be thousands. And if every one of those people could also train, change just a little bit, you know, that all of a sudden you're talking about millions and billions of people, right? It is absolutely possible. So this idea of karma means things aren't so simple. They're not so known. We, we tend to like a, a doctrine that just puts it out really simply and puts it out in black and white. This is good. This is bad. Da, 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 da. It's simple. We just want to take that and, you know, not get too complicated about it. But nothing in life is like that. Nothing. That's why we're constantly confused. Even simple things, your computer, your, your phone, they're, they're so complicated. Why would karma be applied in this very black and white way? It's not that way at all. So to add to that, Samuel Vior writes, in life there are three types of action. First are actions that are the outcome of accidents, or simply they correspond to the law of accidents. Second are actions that are the outcome of karma. Third, are actions performed by conscious will. These are truly characteristic of initiates, masters, those who already have an individual conscious will. So, accidents happen. Suffering exists because people behave badly and wrongly. And it wasn't divine law that they were supposed to act that way, and it wasn't divine law that people had to suffer in the way that they suffered. But in this world, there is something called free will. And it would be worse if there was no free will. It doesn't even make sense. So it's a sort of, that's the freedom of, of our, that we have. The ability to do good or the ability to do bad. So second, our actions are the outcome of karma. All right, so I've talked a lot about what karma isn't. What 
does it mean that if there is some karma that we have, what would that mean? What would that be like? Well, a lot of times these are situations where we try really hard and we have a good plan and we're very reasonable. We really want a certain thing to happen and we try really hard and it just doesn't work. And the person next to us tries just as hard. They also have a nice plan, but their, their situation works out well. Or we might try three times. You know, maybe someone tries to start a business three, four, five times and they're just, they just fail every time. But they're a good person. They're a good character. They have good characteristics. They're working hard. And then someone else doesn't have that issue. That might be karma. I'm not saying it is. But there's something there where the person feels like they're almost getting a punishment. Maybe in a previous life, they treated others in a, in a bad way, you know? And they're learning something psychological about their situation. Karma is very big with the people that are close to us in our life, our family, our partners. And this is why you know, some, some people, they get together, they're very attracted to each other, they're very... Um, they feel pulled to each other. And yet, then they start antagonizing each other and hurting each other and all the pain and suffering with all the drama that everybody goes through. A lot of times when it's, it's really tough and they break, break up, you get back together, all that kind of stuff, and you can't figure it out. It's pain if you're with the person. It's pain with, if you're not with the person. That might be karma. Situation where you're paying... It's not about your physical situation so much. It's about, this, it's about your emotional pain that you're going through and learning about yourself based on what's going on. That's how karma is applied a lot. You know, the karma may come through physical situations. Or it might come through poverty. It's not to say that everyone who is poor has a karma for it, but it could come to that, you know. That could be a relationship. The thing is, you don't know unless you have some intuition or some experience that would tell you. Otherwise, you're sort of unsure. So you always have to sort of work on yourself and work through your life without complaining about it, without protesting. Because whether or not it's a karma that's being applied or whether it's just... In this life, you just didn't realize, you made some mistake. It doesn't matter. You should just work on yourself. Just reflect on what your situation is. And we have practices, we have meditation, we have dream yoga, we have dream analysis, things like that, which can sort of give you some intuition about maybe this certain situation is. It's like a, a karmic situation. And I just have to keep working and doing good things and asking for forgiveness and things can be forgiven. So Jesus and Christianity talks a lot about the forgiveness of sins. But what they get wrong, most forms of Christianity, is they believe that you can be forgiven just by believing in Jesus or just by believing in God and that's enough for everything to be forgiven. Really, from the Gnostic perspective, which is our perspective. Forgiveness of sins occurs when we have comprehended the nature of our, of our sin. Because you can do something really bad because our state of mind is terrible, and then be sorry that you did it, but you don't really comprehend what actually happened. The forgiveness of sins happens, meaning when, you get, when something's forgiven, it means you don't have to pay with pain, with more pain. It means you're forgiven, we'll take that karmic energy and do something else with it. These cosmic beings, God, whoever you want to talk about it. But if you didn't comprehend why you did it, why would you be forgiven of it? Because then you could just be forgiven of the karma, and then you go do it again, because that state of mind hasn't been understood by yourself yet. So the forgiveness of sins happens after you've comprehended why you did it. So if you comprehend why you did it, then you can say, ask for forgiveness. Like, this help me not be this way anymore. I understand what I was doing, but I'm not that way anymore. Like, you know, can, that's, and again, we have practices related to that, prayers. 
So that does exist. Karma is just not a mechanical law. But you don't get forgiven just be, you don't just get forgiven just because. That doesn't make any sense. Because karma is like an energy. So if you're if you see someone on a swing set and they're swinging really high and they've got lots of energy and all of a sudden they're like I can't stop, help me, help me, help me. What do you have to do? You know, they're too afraid to jump off. They, 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 they're screaming. What, do you, what would you do to, to help them out? You would have to somehow get in front of them and stop the swing and take all the energy to stop them. Right? Because you, you would have to take that energy. So when, when, when something's forgiven karmically, something has to take the energy. Because we put, let's say I did something terrible, that energy's I mean, it's not physical energy. It's, it's in the other dimensions. But it's there. It's waiting. It's an unresolved situation. It has, to, it has to play out. It's going to play out. Unless some other energy transforms it. So in this sense, you know, the swing or the pendulum just keep on swinging until something else can stop it. So, and then that, what I'm trying to say is that if we have proper comprehension, there are what do you want to call it? God, masters, initiates, whatever, that can help us forgive that karma. Our own inner, we have own inner part, part of ourselves called our inner divine mother that can work with that karma. But it doesn't come just because they snap their fingers or click their, click their heels or something like that. Something has to take that karma and transform that energy into something else. It's not something we can do. So we should know that just because we do something bad, it doesn't mean that we're doomed. If we were doomed, there'd be no point to any of this stuff. We, we're here, presumably, because we, we, there is a path and we can walk it. It is possible to walk it. Now, the third type of action is those actions performed by conscious will. So this means we're doing something based on consciousness, meaning not desire, not fear, not anxiety, not ambition. What do we actually do that's not based on any of those things? Very difficult to even understand what I'm talking about. Because if you think, you might think, well, everything I do is based on I wanted to get something. I want to get this. I want to get that. So it takes a lot of reflection. It takes a lot of work on ourselves to know the difference between when our mind and our consciousness is wrapped up in these egotistical elements. In Buddhism, they're called kleshas or aggregates. And what is our pure essence? So we have our pure essence, our pure soul, and then we have all this garbage on top of it. It's like a, a jewel in a landfill. That's who we are, basically. And that jewel is so precious and so beautiful that even though it's, there's so much garbage on top of it, we can still see how beautiful it is. And we still have that. We have that connection. We, we sense that. But we also sense that there's a lot of garbage. And it's kind of like... You have a light source, and then you could put a filter over it that changes the color, or makes it darker, or makes it dimmer, or makes it cloudy. That's who we are. We have this very pristine light. We know how to get to it, but it's always covered up with so much garbage. And so what, what real action is, is action that's that pure light, just pure consciousness. Well, what we always have is some impure mixture you know, sometimes we're more egotistical. Sometimes we might be less egotistical. That's, and we, we want to work towards being less, so that's good. But then there's this type of action which is pure. And that's exemplified in all the prophets and all the avatars. You see the way that they talk, the way that they're present. You can get a, no, a feeling of that. And you see a truly great being transforming the world. You see that that's coming from their consciousness. It's not coming from their body. It's not coming from, from just the neurons of their, and the chemicals of their brain. They're, they're speaking with their consciousness through their body. And it's beautiful. You, you look at that. You look at a, a great being that has transformed the world. 
or taught a very beautiful doctrine. And uh, we're, we're in awe of that. But we should know that we have the exact same capacity inside of us. They, are, they might be different than our condition, but in principle they are no different than us, and we are no different than them. Any great being, any angel, any diva, any god, was at one time the same type of condition we're in right now. That's beautiful. So it, it means that there's a lot that we can develop into, a lot that we can aspire to. So we also find some people who basically don't have any discernment. They just don't want to think about it. If you were to ask me, is there a world beyond? If I thought there was a world beyond, I would declare to you there is a world beyond. But I do not say this is the way, nor it is that way, nor it is otherwise. I do not say it is not so, nor do I say it is not not so. In other words, people who just don't want to think about this stuff. They just don't want to think about it. They just, they're not going to make any effort to think about it. And by doing that, somehow that avoids the problem of figuring out what it is. And again, you can find people, I mean, it's, I just find it very interesting that this stuff was written over 2,500 years ago, but you find people today the same exact way. Another thing, I think we pretty much talked about this, is the immediacy of results. There are, had been some Brahmins and contemplatives who hold a doctrine in view like this. All those who kill living beings experience pain and distress in the here and now. All those who take what is not given, who engage in illicit, illicit sex, who tell lies, experience pain and distress in the here and now. So, Hedman, when those Brahmins and contemplatives who hold a doctrine in a view like this say, all those who kill living beings experience pain and distress in the here and now, do they speak truthfully or falsely? Falsely, Lord. Lord Buddha. So, what Buddha is talking about here is that you could do some really bad stuff in this life. It doesn't mean that you're going to have the karma for that in this life. You can do some really great things in this life. It doesn't mean you're going to see the results of that karma in this life. So there are lots of people who have lots of power, and they're doing lots of things that are no good. That's not the way karma works. It, karma doesn't smite someone, you know, just because instantly they, they did something. So we have to take a long-term view of that. And again, that's for us and for everyone else. Sometimes like, how is that happening? Why is this person allowed to, to behave that way and cause such harm. But we also have to remember, you know, when we think we're getting away with something, because we don't have immediacy of results, you know, if we're behaving in a certain way, we're falsely accusing other people, we're gossiping about people, all sorts of things, we're sort of lying or cheating or not really, we're, we're taking something that's not really owed, you know, in another lifetime, that's, those things will happen to us. Or, you know, even in this lifetime. But what's happening in this lifetime might not be based on what's happened, what we're doing in this lifetime. So, I'm just going to wrap this up with a couple axioms. Other things to remember or to go by is that karma is paid not only for the evil that is done, but also for the good that could be done, yet is left undone. Meaning, if there's an opportunity in front of us where really we, we, we should have helped someone, but we just chose to not act, that's just as, as could be just as bad as inflicting harm on someone. In other words, sometimes it's really bad to speak up and to kind of butt in and, and think you know how to solve some problem and start getting in some you know getting in someone's face or just in someone's situation. You know, sometimes you need to be silent, let other people work things out. But sometimes you need to speak up. <laughs> sometimes you might need to know how to say something in a very skillful and, and beautiful, sincere way to help someone or some situation calm down. Now, to know how to do that is extremely difficult. That's exactly, the, that's exactly the work. 
to reflect, to meditate, to learn how to do this. Secondly, each evil action is a bill of exchange that we sign in order to pay in the next life. Third, when an inferior law is transcended by a superior law, the superior law washes away the inferior law. So this is why a forgiveness of sins or a forgiveness of karma is possible, because we can do superior acts, we can do superior things that pay for other negative things that we've done. So we should endeavor to do that. And we build up, you know, sort of a spiritual bank account. And if we have a mistake, but we have money in our spiritual bank account, we may still have to pay for that mistake, but it won't be so bad. But if we have nothing in the bank and we do something wrong, you can be sure that you're going to pay with a lot of pain, emotional, psychological, physical pain, depending. So someone who, does, who just goes around very miserly and never does anything good for anyone else, the smallest little thing happens and they're suffering a lot. The lords of karma and the tribunals of objective justice judge souls for their deed, their concrete, clear, and definitive facts, and never for good intentions. This is very, also can be very controversial. Meaning, it doesn't matter if we wanted to do something really nice for someone. If we ended up doing something harmful towards them, that's what matters. Is that saying, good, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? Most of the time, a lot of us have good intentions. I mean, it doesn't happen that often where we're really plotting to be evil against someone. At least that's not my experience. But it's the results that matter. And a lot of times we like to wash our hands from the bad results. Say, well, I was doing good for you, but you didn't know how to blah, 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 blah. And we blame them for the negative results. So we need to be very, very mature here and look at what are the results. The thing about an intention is that it is necessary. We, sh we, we always need a good intention. We should never have a bad intention. But that intention is basically free. So why, why we ever have a bad intention towards anybody is, our, is, a, is really a problem for ourselves. The intention, the good intention is always free. You just have a good intention for other people and for having other people doing well. But it's never enough. It's the results that count. So, results speak for themselves. Good intentions are worthless if the facts are disastrous. So, we'll end there. And uh, if you guys have any questions, we can take them. We'll take them now. Why does uh, consciousness need this experience in the absence of the ego that is developed through experience? is what we're trying to liberate the liberation from. It's a good question. So the, the question is, why, why do we need to go through this if, you know, if, if, if what we need is not the ego, right? Well, the situation is bigger than what I just presented in this lecture. In relationship to, like, the book of Genesis, it talks about this, the fall. That there was some other... There was some other condition of humanity, which then they fell. And through that falling, they become knowledgeable of good and evil. So there's the difference between that pristine consciousness, that gem I was talking about. There's one characteristic that gets developed, which is self-cognizance, self-wisdom. So you, like, like, a, like a baby, you can see their pristine consciousness because they don't have a personality, they don't have, they don't have an ego present when they're very an infant, especially first couple of years. You can see in their eyes, you can see their beauty. We all have exactly that, but there's the difference between that pristine consciousness that does not have wisdom of its own nature versus that pristine consciousness that also has wisdom of its own nature as that consciousness. So there's this innate type of ignorance. It's like a, like a virginal type of ignorance. They're, they're, we, we have a soul 
that is not developed, but also has ego. So we need to get rid of the ego, but also develop our soul. So two different things. The ego is karma that we get for our bad actions. So when someone, when we're tempted and, uh, to be angry, or we feel anxious, or afraid, and we go into this rumination, and we expend a lot of psychological energy, we're actually building a new pattern or strengthening patterns in our mind. And that's our ego. So we're using energy to build more ego, and that builds up our fear, so the next time it happens, we're actually more fear, or more anxious, or more angry. All of those things. We have to know how to comprehend that, eliminate that. And when we eliminate that, we extract something. We extract a significance. Why was this happening? Why did I always go towards that fear, that hatred of other or hatred of self or that anxiety? Why did I always go there? Why did I see it? And, and you understand, I saw something in the wrong way. I see things in a new way now. And it's this little like drop of wisdom that you have now that you didn't have before. And that's your, that's your wisdom. You build up your wisdom atom by atom, pulling back all of those pieces, but with wisdom now. Because right now we have the ego, but it's not just like one thing. It's, it's like we're bottled up in a thousand different glass jars. And in, whenever we're inside one of them, we see the world in this way. You know, when our jealousy is invoked and we see someone else really beautiful or has a really nice car or that has a really nice job or, or just a lifestyle they re we really want, we feel jealous. We're actually living inside a little bottle of jealousy. And we see through those lenses. And we might, you know, and same with fear, hatred, all those things. We learn how to comprehend our mind. We, we break that jar. And it's the same, it's a symbol of the genie coming out of the lamp. But we are actually the genie. Our, our own consciousness. So through the experience of making mistakes, we build the ego and karma. So karma and ego are the, you know, two sides of the same thing. When we comprehend our mistakes, we can eliminate the ego, return to a pristine level of, of consciousness, but with, with that one added thing of, of wisdom, of, of knowledge. That is the knowledge of good and evil. That's why we say gnosis is what is our salvation, because that gnosis is a Greek word that means knowledge. That's the basis of what Gnosticism, what Gnosticism comes from. That, that type of special, transcendent knowledge. about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.